thank God for another opportunity that we can gather and sit and learn from the Lord, learn from His Word. It is amazing how time flies. But nevertheless, He's given us another day where we can glean from His Word. But more than that, say it again, and I hope to say it as long as I'm alive. It is more than acquisition of information. But the information must transform us. And the information must propel us to act. Must propel us to do what the Lord called us to do. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. It's not an option. If you love me, you will do what I ask you to do. And so we thank God for another opportunity. Father, we are so grateful. We thank you for life. The Bible says in Psalms 90, verse 1, from generation to generation, O God, Thou art God. You are almighty. You are sovereign. And later in that psalm, Moses cries out, So teach us to number our days. Thank you for another day. Moses told us that God has given to man three score and ten. And he said if the strong ones, we manage to make it, we go to 80 years ago. Oh God, teach us to number every day. Every day. The life we now live is but a microcosm of eternity. Small time span. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to live how godly yes, yes, and soberly. Yes, yes. Teach us to live in the same Psalm 90. Teach us to live with wisdom. Yes, Lord Jesus. To understand that life appeared for a little while yes. and as a vapor it disappeared. Yes. We don't know how long we have, but God, teach us to live wisely. Have your way today. Open your word to us. Share with us, O oh Father. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Mr. Natalie O'Brien, good evening to you. Just a few on Facebook. Sister Anne Marie Elliot, good evening to you, family. And good evening to all those in person. Amen. We thank God that we can come another day. And that sound is truly, maybe when you get home and maybe, I don't know, tomorrow, let's look at that sound. It, it, it is called the funeral sound. We don't know why they call it that. But it begins with the, this God, this almighty God. He has been, he doesn't have any beginning and he neither will really have any ending. Amen and uh, teach us the number of days. And so we thank God that we can gather one more time. It's always a privilege to share God's word. It is a privilege. We're in the gospel according to Matthew. And Deacon, we seem to be unable to finish. I'm only in Matthew chapter five, and Matthew has 20 chapters. I'm not so sure when we'll get there. The point is not, as it is in school, finishing the book. The point is going line upon line. The point is learning what God wants us to learn. The point is being transformed from glory to glory. The objective is becoming more like Jesus. And so if it takes a while, then that is what we must do. We must take a while and study the book. Amen? Amen. Amen. And uh, last week we were looking at salt and light. And this metaphor that Jesus used, Brother Ashley, Matthew chapter 5, verses 
think 11 and 12 or 12 and 13. This metaphor, and, and you must always remember that the society back then was an agrarian society, Sister Marcia. That means agricultural. And so a lot of concepts and metaphors which are used, they would understand them because it was an agrarian society. Amen? We're starting here somewhere around there. And I want to maybe just recap a little bit and then come forward. But I want to remind us, brothers and sisters, those watching via the worldwide web and those who are in person, that Christianity is not about a life that is informed with certain truths. Christianity is not about a life that is conformed to certain practices and rituals. That's not what Christianity in its purest form is about. Sadly, we have made it about that and about those things. But Christianity is not about conforming or a life that is conformed to certain practices. I heard a young lady said she went to Mass, but then she was telling her friends what she did while she was at Mass. It's amazing. I can't repeat in this atmosphere. I can tell Brother James when we're by ourselves what she told her friend that she was doing while the Mass was in process. Wow. A pastor said to me, you'll be amazed at what some people view on their phones in service. <laughs> oh Lord have mercy, help me Jesus. I don't know where I get these things from. He said, Pastor, I'm telling you, when people get the password for the Wi-Fi, you'll be amazed at what happens. And so you have to protect that, Brother Or We'll talk more about that. So it's not being conformed to certain practices because you can be heavily involved in the practices of a religion. But you don't know God. Amen. Jesus made a very frightening statement, which, whenever I think about it, I get I try to get my life in line. He says, one of the ways, especially in the end time, when he comes again, people are going to say to him, Lord, Lord, did I not? That's a frightening statement, is the master. Yes. In your name. They come, what is it? They what? They cast out. Could you imagine that? Demons left, they cut in the name of Jesus. And we will become so, and we are so awestruck. And, oh, demons left. Yet Jesus will say to them, Depart from me, good God. And he called them, Ye workers of iniquity. I'm just trying to preach to you the unadulterated word of God and to myself. I never knew you. And when I looked at that scripture again, that's the part that struck me. He said, I never knew you. You weren't even good God of mercy. Good God of mercy. Christianity is not to conform to certain practices and rituals. So we take the Lord's Supper, communion, some people only come only as night to get a blessing for the new year. It's amazing what we have done with God's house. So we can be busy in the building, but we are not. You can be busy doing a lot of stuff in the building, you know. Who up, down, in, out. But that doesn't mean you have a relationship with God. You have a relationship with the religion. Oh, you like the church name, whatever the name is. But God, oh, that's a whole different thing. Sister Marcia, could I say it again? Christianity is not about the life. It's conformed to certain practices 
and ritual. The girl said she was at mass and she's doing her own stuff. Isn't that amazing? And then Jesus said, Two shall be in the field when the trumpet sounds. That means not everybody going to heaven. Brother James, let me go on this thing terribly. You know. Christianity is about a life that has been transformed. Through a relationship, Sister Janelle, with the living God. Let me say it again. Christianity is about the life that has been transformed through a relationship with the living God. You can go back to the slide, Brother Ash. Well, that's what it's about. But when you allow yourself to be transformed, then and only then you become salt and light. And let me tell you, when you're transformed by the power of God, you cannot help being salt and light. Could I say that again? Thank you. Go ahead. This Mama Gaian thing we have in church, you cannot help being a transformed person. You are just salty. You're just light bringing. You can't help yourself. You cannot help yourself. Listen to me. I find it absolutely difficult maybe to have a conversation even with people in the world and one of the words in my sentences don't relate to God. Exactly. Did you hear what I just said to you? Amen. When you are salty, it doesn't matter if you're talking to a president, a prime minister, an unsaved, a philistine, somewhere in your conversation, God will come out of your mouth because what is inside, oh God have mercy, has got to come out. And so people will know you that you... You are a child of God because it doesn't matter what you tell them. Somehow you come back to. Yes. Hmm. Right. Go ahead. If you are an authentic Christ follower, listen carefully, I'm going slowly. Yeah, you can move on a few things. If you are an authentic Christ follower, people should sense something about you that is not of this world. That's right. Is that all right? Be distracted. People should sense something about you that is not of this world, that is radically different than what they, they have going on. That's why if you're not supposed to be too loved in this world and be worried about it, when you go around certain people, they ought to find themselves uncomfortable when they are in your presence or when you are in their presence. You're not going to everybody to like you. Everybody's not going to like you. You're going to make them uncomfortable because you are sore. You're radically different. Your house is run differently. Oh God, oh God. When they step into your home, it is different. When I come at your home, bless you. But when you step in, it is different. The way the members of this house interact, we interact different. It's, oh God. There's something about us that is totally different. I think we have stopped preaching these things. We have been preaching all kinds of stories for the last decades and more. And so there is a sense of a dumbing down and watering down of the gospel. And we've been preaching all kinds of things. And, and so we have developed people who go to church. That's why people go to church. See, that is ritualistic. They, they, they go to church not realizing it doesn't matter how much we teach you are the church you don't go to church you are the church the church assembles in the building not you're going to church but our language doesn't change it doesn't matter how much we preach they are still going to go to church Sunday and you see the way you say it means you can divorce yourself from the building so you go to church and then you leave and you go back home. And I, 
But I was in another country I learned about putting on Jesus on Sunday and taking him off. He became a piece of government now. It's amazing. It's amazing. Some things I see in the assemb in, in, in assemblies is radically different. These people should pick up that there's something in your friendship, something in your marriage, in your parenting, in the way you work. You have many things I listed there? The decisions you make. When people come into contact with you, the values you hold, they should be radically different than what the other people have going on in their lives. Why? Because we have been trans. Oh God. We don't live to eat. But we eat to live. There's a big difference with the two. But people today live for material stuff. Live for for what uh, they have when they, they get headache and stress if those things are taken from them. But the child of God has different values. And, oh God of mercy. The way we parent should be different. The decisions we make, the values you hold, they are different from the rest of the world. There should be moments in your day in, day out living, your interacting, your leading, your following day. In other words, in your existence, in the entire existence, once you become a child of God and you are transformed, there are moments where you reveal the soul and the light of Jesus every single day. Amen. People can't help but see it. You reveal it and it comes out. It, it, it just come out. It just come out. And it's amazing. People say they love God but they don't pray. We are lying to ourselves. There is no way you can be soul and light and don't pray. You are religious. Anybody who is a child of God, transform, must pray because that is how I am sustained. Yeah. <sighs> I'm sustained because I have to talk to him. Yeah. Jesus told them in John 15, um, 14, elder, deacon, or 15, he said, I am the one. He deliberately gave them this, here we go again, another agricultural metaphor. Why? Because he wants them to understand, you can't live without me. There's a difference between living and existing. Let me move on, let me move on. You might be able to exist, but life, I came that you might have life. Life. No wonder Moses said in Psalms 90, teach us the number. And I found it amazing, you see, you're always contemplating on some part of the Bible. I found it amazing, Moses said, teach us the number of days, not months and years. Days, days, every day, every day, teachers. If that isn't happening, if you're not being salt, you're not being light. If you're not being salt, you're not being light. It's your choice. I said, if we are not being salt, or being light. And if that isn't happening, and that is your choice whether it does or not. Oh, what in, oh pastor, no oh, psalmist, I think wrong chord, none of that. The world will decay and continue to grope around in the dark. Why? Because God's people who we left to go into all of the world have been doing their own thing. And then when something happens in the country, watch the reaction. Call a prayer. Let me pray. Let me pray. Oh God. Yet they quote God's word to say, men are. But the only time we pray is when something happens in the country. Oh, let's call a prayer meeting. That is hypocrisy. That's why God not listening to us. God says, pray every day. Being around the military people, the national security, I learned what they said to me. They said, the more we sweat during peace time, the less we bleed during war. When Trinidad going good, is now we must pray. Yeah, yeah. Don't wait for something to happen. 
When your family going good, give him praise. Tell him thank you every morning. Thank you for grace. But we are reactive people. And then when we react to the situation, and so we will call a prayer meeting for the situation. The minute God gives a little reprieve, we go right back to not pray. Waiting for the next. And the world will continue to go around in the dark. I remember as a young man going to school. I preached. I was the president of the Bible club. And when I went to teacher's college, a very dear friend of mine, another pastor, called me and gave me the keys, metaphorically, of the Bible group that he had at teacher's college. And he said, young man, I want you to keep this Bible club until you leave here. And by the grace of God, I did. Preaching, teaching. I remember students used to gather, all these teachers, when they said sometime, oh, that's the time they came. And they wanted prayer, and I would pray for them. But every time there's Bible club, during my lunch hour, I went there. I remember I was given the opportunity, Sister Lane, to get on stage where you had the principal of the college and all the top dogs. And we were able to show, we, I brought in a group and they showed the abortion film. These people were able to talk to students. I don't know the seeds that were planted, they left as years ago. God just called us to plant seeds. He didn't call us to worry about anything else. The point I'm making is, maybe the reason that the college didn't flood or destroy with a fire was because of the influence of the word of God being spoken at the college. I wonder if we still have ISIVs here. I wonder if Christian children are still in Bible. Or we are more concerned today about getting A's rather than also balancing and serving God. But we will continue. But when something happens, we want God. We are groping around in darkness because the influence is missing. And I really do mean it's our choice. If you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, then you would have to suppress this in your life. You have to suppress being salt and light. You have to suppress it. Because it's supposed to just out of your bellies. It's supposed to just flow. But you have to suppress it. You have to try and keep it buried. Or as Jesus said, you have to put your light under a bowl. Jesus said, nobody likes. I can't look, put it under. Nobody does that. The irony is, many people do that. Hide it. And why do they hide their light? Some because they're embarrassed or awkward. They're embarrassed. But more because they just don't think they have a responsibility to be that light. You are the light in your home. You are the light in your community. You are the light on your job. You are the light where you are. And last week I told you about one of the most tragic events in recent American history in 1964 in New York City. Remember that? A young woman from Queens named Kitty. Genovese was stopped to death. But it was no ordinary murder. She was chased. And by the way, I was just looking, just now, I was just looking on the internet. And I have a video to show the church on Sunday. So you can see what this world is coming to the evil. And it's now in the house of God. I was just looking at a video. Police doing their job in New York City and a 16 year old almost wrestled with the police, fight in the subway. He refused to pay his fee. She was stabbed to death, but it was no ordinary murder. She was chased by her assailant and attacked three times on the street over the course of half an hour. While 38, 38, of our neighbors watch from their windows during the entire ordeal not a single okay. person came to her aid deacon 
Not a single person shouted or called for help. No one ran to her aid or came to her rescue. You see it every day, you know, every day people, it's called self-preservation, not me, I'm not getting involved in that. No one even bothered to pick up a phone and to call the police. Last week I told you about the social experiment. Where a man got a mask and snatched the young lady from the street. And everybody, we are busy about our lives, going about, getting to work, so we can pay our bills. And they were all right there. Nobody said anything. They simply watched. Now why did they do that? And then the two New York psychologists, one from Columbia University, and the one from New York University, they decided they wanted to dig deeper into what they called, my son was telling me he studied this in psychology, the bystander problem. It's a year one for semester course in psychology. We had a fascinating set of values outlined by Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Tipping Point. These two psychologists decided they would stage a series of emergencies of different kinds and in different settings in order to see who would come to help. See, this is what I like about those people. They do research. They found out that one single factor, one, determined whether people responded to a need. One factor. What was it? It wasn't the severity of the crisis. It wasn't the degree to which the person screamed or called for help. It wasn't that. It wasn't even the characteristics of the people in the experiment. In other words, whether they were young or old, male or female, black or white, Miss Morris, it wasn't that. What mattered, whether people help or not, Mr. Craig, was how many witnesses they were to the event. That was the single factor. And so they call it in psychology the bystander problem. How many people witness the event? In other words, the more people who were around, the less people tended to respond. Hmm. Oh, Lord of mercy. The more people are around, the less people tended to respond. In one of their experiments, they had a student who was alone in a room, staged an epileptic fit. One student in a room. When there was just one person next door listening, that person rushed 85% of the time to the person's aid. When there was only one person listening. This is more you get in it. But when the test subjects thought that there were as few as four others who also overheard the commotion or overheard the person having the seizure, they came to the student's aid only 31% of the time. So it dropped from 85 to 31 response. Why? Because the sense of responsibility has been spread out. Are you getting it? We have more people. Therefore, I can relax because others are seeing The essence of what the two psychologists discovered is that when people are in a group, responsibility for taking personal action is diffused. When they're in a group. In other words, it gets watered down. Why? Because we all go on the assumption 
that somebody else will make a call. And what happens after a while is nobody does anything. Because everybody Okay, good. You got it now. Good. Somebody else, Deacon, you know about that, will report the problem. And they're wondering why TTP is not doing anything. But everybody don't call and tell us. How will we know? When I talk, when you thought wrong, nobody called. The problem. Report the problem or respond to the need. So in the case of that young lady, Kitty, social psychologists argue that the lesson isn't that no one called despite the fact that 38 people were not screaming. I'm going to go again. The psychologists argue that the lesson isn't that no one called Despite the fact that 13 people heard her scream, it's that no one called because 13 people heard her scream. That's exactly why they didn't call. In other words, had she been attacked on a lonely street, according to the psychologist, with just one witness, she might have lived. Some that person, the percentage is higher, would have intervened. Because there's nobody else. There's only you alone there. She might have lived. Why is that so? That one person might have felt a sense of obligation to respond. It is my duty to respond. They would have been moved by the fact that it really was up to them. There's nobody else. Don't look around. There's nobody else. You can't call on anyone. Jesus is wanting to cut through the bystander problem. Let me tell you. I've discovered something in my studies as I looked around. When a church gathering is small, we do plenty things for God. Listen carefully what I'm saying. I've done this teaching. When a, you know, they say they, they, they categorize churches small, medium, large. When a church is small, and by small, they're talking about like zero to 50 members. Number one, you feel love in that God. Come on now, do you see where I'm going? Everybody knows everybody. When it comes to evangelism, oh God, have mercy. Everybody almost turns up fever. It's such a small gathering. We see it as our responsibility. What are the problems with a church that grows? When the church begins to grow, well, Jezebel and all these children. Now the 
the attention I used to get. Now you can't give it to me like that anymore because now we have other people in the family. And as it gets bigger, oh, Jesus, is a person. It's one of the things I said I wanted to study so many things in my head. When a church is small, you said, let's go and share tracks. Everybody. When it gets bigger now, it's the missions and evangelism department that like they business. Oh, no, man. Oh, don't let me. I know you don't want me to preach, so let me finish this. Let me go home and uh, drink water. I should do what? <laughs> My, my business. It's it's only a departmental problem. It's no more the church. Because we have grown. As a matter of fact, the larger it gets, now you have to pay to get things done. Oh God, how was When it was a small thing, oh God, everybody's so excited. We love it. Uh -huh. When it gets bigger, now it's comparison. When you give that one, and you give Jesus, how was the reason she would stand a chance on a lonely street is because the one person might have felt a sense of obligation to respond. That person would have moved by the fact that it was up to the person. Jesus wants to cut through the bystander problem. He wants to cut through it. Each of his affirmations in, in the original Greek begins with the emphatic pronoun, you. You are salt of the earth. I want hear the government. You are salt of the earth. They need you. They don't know what we know. You are salt of the earth. Every, everything in the original Greek says, you are. You are. You are. I, as if to say, you and only you are the what? The earth's Salt. Somebody says, creation is groaning and waiting for them. The manifestation of the sons of waiting for us to be whom God says we ought to be. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's waiting. You and only you are the world's light. I and only I. I'm the world's light. Only you, nobody else. In other words, we're trying to say, Deacon, is that each child of God has a what? A personal responsibility. But we have removed that over the years. A personal. I have to see it as my job. Friends, there is a great revolution that has been set in motion by God through Jesus Christ for the reclaiming of this world. A great revolution. Other than Psalms 90, I was telling you about what I was looking at last evening. The other thing I was reading today was how each apostle died. I took some time off today to look at how each apostle died. And I was ashamed of myself. Repenting. When you see what these men give up for the gospel sake. Somebody said Paul will be turning in his grave. He can't turn in his grave. But I understand what the person is saying. When you see what the, it, it is said, Peter, Peter even tell them on, 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 on an X, on an upside down cross, don't even crucify me the same way as Jesus. I am unworthy to die as Jesus. Turn me upside down. It is reported that some of them, when they were going to die, they were either still preaching the gospel, still giving God glory. Remember Stephen? Yes. Heaven opened up when Stephen saw. What we have today, I have no idea what it is. I have no idea. You are either in or you're out. I always tell you there's no middle ground. Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You are either in or you're out. You can't help it. Remember I said you can't help being so. 
you cannot help him. You're in the job and you cannot help him. You're teaching and Jesus will come up something. We have learned to, in certain areas when we are lecturing, this is Morris, in certain areas we are lecturing, there's certain strategies. As a matter of fact, um, when you do missionary work and those missionaries who go to places like China and Iran and so on, we think we have a, we have a good life in Trinidad. When you go to those places, they can't even, you can't even, listen to me, they, 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 in North Korea, they check your Facebook profile. If they only smell that you are trying to convert people, the firing squad is what waiting for you in. Yet, there are people in those countries that are risking their lives China, those places are what you call underground churches. Thousands of believers gather. Some of them we have to send the Bible in pages for them. And they're so happy to consume it. But in the West, we have Bible in English, Bible in French, Bible in Spanish. And we don't read it. But in some countries, they glad for just one chapter from one book. In the entire, oh, they guard it so preciously because they can't read it openly. They give their lives. The apostles died for Jesus. The minute they experience, oh, by the way, to be an, an apostle, you have to have seen, you have to have walked with Jesus. And that is why Paul had his own experience. That's what they're going to talk to Paul. That's why Jesus appeared. Because all the others before Paul walked with Jesus. They saw him. Yes, yes. So when he came, he was like an outsider. Yes. But before that, on the road of Damascus, Jesus himself appeared to Saul. Yes. And so Paul had his own experience. When you get an experience with the transforming power of God, it will shape your life. It will shape your family. It will shape the core of your belief. I never forgot that book and the subsequent movie that I read. I saw on the book that I read with Nikki Cruz. Anybody remember that? Yeah. See those are books and movies. Yeah, I talk about yeah, 1980, I think. Yeah. The cross and the switchblade. Yeah. Here is a youngster that God saved. And then turn him loose back in the same area. Is God still saving the answer? Or is it we praying that the police kill them? Oh, Shoot them out and kill them. He says we pray, oh Lord. Oh Lord, kill them out. Oh Lord, you know we can't. What is that? Or we pray, let the glorious light of this gospel. Because they may die, but their soul goes to a lost eternity. You're eating or you're out. Listen to the next one. You're either, you're salty, or you have no taste at all. The COVID has a way of taking away your taste. When you get COVID, you don't taste anything. Brother Ashton, yeah, I had COVID, and good food, I'm seeing the food. Why do you want to eat it? That tasted well. And, and I'm complaining and my wife said, what is the matter with you? I said, this food is that. What kind of food you go in this place, man? <laughs> and it's then I realized, wait a minute, this thing is affecting your taste. And so now you want spicy food. You see me trying to hold it and pep on the food. Because your taste is gone. Jesus said, you are either salty or you have no taste at all. In Revelation, he says, you know what you want? You know you hot? Or cold, you just look warm. Is there an answer? The lights on, the lights on, me business. The lights on, the lights on, me business. Neither. Just you know, there are people floating through life, just floating through life. Whatever happens, happens. You're light, or you are. Watch this now because. There's a concept people talk about being on the fence. Listen, there's no such thing about sitting on the fence. I want you to go home and try it. <laughs> try sitting on the fence and see how comfortable it is to sit on the fence. 
So when you hear people tell you, oh, I'm neutral, you lie, and you have an opinion, you just don't want to share it. You are either for God or against God. You are either light or you are part of darkness. You are either growing or you're dead. There is no in between. If you're not growing in Christ, you are dead. Deader than dead. Oh God, help me, have mercy, Jesus. But the, those of us who claim to follow Christ, there is a target on the wall. That one, Deacon. There's a target on the wall. For those of us who claim to follow Christ, there is a target on the wall. First, is reaching the lost. Not so, reaching out to the lost and dying. I don't think I can preach this anymore. First, it's reaching out to the lost and dying. There's a lost and dying world out there every day. Every day, they're dying. They're losing their life. I went to a funeral on Monday. Young man, our oh, dear sister's brother-in-law, young man, heart, horse. How is that? When you're so young, who said death is only for old people? He's gone. Family's grieving. There's a lost and dying world. With the one and only message that can transform someone's entire eternity. Let me tell you the truth. The truth is, a great percentage of Christians have no love for the lost and dying. We have lost our love for the unseen. We are in love with religion. We have lost our passion for the unseen. We are in love with coming to a building. That's what we are in love with. Yeah. So when people are dying, it is not moving us anymore. It doesn't move us. A mission so clear that it's called what? The Great Jesus. It's so clear it's called the Great Commission. That's the light we are to bring. Without shame, without awkwardness, Without reserve, I'm afraid to go out there. Jesus called you. I don't know what to tell people. I feel so timid. What? I can't speak. Well, give a try. But with the Great Commission comes a cultural commission to work toward the kingdom of God. Taking hold on the planet in governance and institutions and judicial systems and media. Look at what the media show. Look at the shows. Look at the show. But what is this happening is if Brother Ashton decides to do something in drama, Christians don't show up to that. Spending money, rent, now. They ain't coming to you. <laughs> Christians watching the unseen. <laughs> and here you have a Christian group that is doing well, but mm -mm, they come. This Great Commission is supposed to take a hold and propel us to work toward the kingdom of God in government. And so if you are in government, Bring the influence of the kingdom. They must see and know that you are a child of God. If you are a minister in any government and you are a Christian, bring the kingdom of God and his influence to bear on your ministry. You ain't going to have to make money and to fleece the people. Some ministers who are Christians are downright shames to the body of Christ. They have no example of godliness. Stand up for godliness. Your name should not be called in bribery yeah. and corruption. Your name should not be called in that. Some of you looking at me like you never heard messages like this preach. Yeah. Your name should not be called 
You should be a child of God, a minister, a junior minister, whatever you are. Stand up. Stand up for Stand up for Jesus. Somebody bring something under the table. No, 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 sorry. Came to the wrong person. Stand up like the sergeant. And they say, no, 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 don't bring mm -mm, Don't carry bribery to you. If you do that, you can deal with you. Serious. From where I came from back home, some people have sad testimonies in government. It's very, very sad. And then they identify with Jesus Christ. What about the judicial systems? Do justly, Michael 6, verse 8. He has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord requires of thee to do justly. Do the right thing. Apply the law without fear or favor, malice or ill will. Do the right thing. The media showing all kinds of smut on the television. That's where we are today. Every show has all kinds. You can't watch your children. You can't leave them unsupervised. Forget children. We can't be watching. Now we have to rent movies. If you want to see something. In Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm coming to an end. I can ease the trauma. In Johannesburg, South Africa. Mm -hmm. On the 10th anniversary of the end of apartheid. That anniversary came. You know why? Because behind the scenes, part of the reason, people worked for God's kingdom. And if you did your history in school, you will see that the people that God used to bring slavery to an end were Christian people. William Wilberforce and so. They believed in God. And in South Africa, they worked for God's kingdom. They worked. I remember stories told of Billy Graham, the late great Billy Graham. He refused to go to South Africa. Why? Because he said, until that apartheid comes to an end, God loves everybody. White, black, he loves them all. So I refuse to come to this country and participate in anything until you bring an end. That's a child of God standing up. We have our own fair share of racism. Some Christians are racist. You cannot be a child of God and be racist. You don't know Jesus, you are the child of the devil. God is not a racist God. Oh, I'm going quiet. God is not a racist God. It doesn't matter what ethnicity, God loves people. For God so loved the world that he gave. You should see around election time what people say about other people. I hope church people are not in that. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I can only hope. I can only hope. It's amazing what we get ourselves involved. Rather than show those people in the world we are light, we are salt, we are of a different kingdom. In this kingdom, he loves and welcomes anybody who repents and accepts Jesus Christ. Your ethnicity doesn't matter at all. Come on to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved. I know people couldn't marry certain people in the church because they are of a different ethnicity. Ooh. Yes. In South Africa, the 10th anniversary of the end of apartheid came because people worked for God's kingdom. In Moscow, you know where Moscow is? This is communism to the highest extent. In a church filled to capacity. Shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the front rows were filled with women wearing scarves, scarves, singing with a passion and intensity 
that was captivating. That's after the fall of the board in the war. Someone leaned over to the pastor and asked through an interpreter who the women were. Who are these women? Because if you understand what happened before, nothing like that could happen. And we'll never forget his answer, the pastor. He said, those are the women who prayed and then lived communism out of Russia. They prayed. They prayed and lived communism out of Russia. Think about those who rescue trafficked children, their children who are trafficked every day. Human trafficking is worse than slavery today. They are wicked, wicked, nasty, wicked people in the dark underworlds and underbellies of this world. Trading children, having intercourse with young children. God is watching every one of them. There are people paying monies to traffic children. There are women who are being trafficked. And wait a minute, our boys are being trafficked too. We have forgotten. That's another time I'm going to talk about boys, but we have forgotten them. There are men, I've seen a show called The Catch a Predator. I've seen that show. Have you ever seen it? The Catch a Predator with Hanson. You will not believe the predators he caught. Try him. To have an affair with the underage child. And those predators included priests. Yeah. Of course. All kinds of people. Teachers, lawyers, doctors. Sometimes we think of just the small people. But all the world of society. Who will rescue those traffic children? Who will rescue the traffic women? Sometimes we see a woman think she wanted. She wanted it. You know, with our work mentality. A lot of them were tricked and trafficked. People are so wicked today, they study you. They look for the weaklings. They're like lions. They're like hunters. They look for those who run away. Those who are not close to their families. And the first thing they do is isolate them from the world. Because isolation helps with control. Am I talking to anybody? Think about those children, traffic, from the brothels in the Philippines. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Those who are attempting to save AIDS, orphans in Africa. Entire families decimated. Mother and father dead. Those children are left to fend for themselves. That's what it means to be light and salt. You stand in the gap and help somebody. The kingdom is what? The kingdom must come. It is meant to come. It has to come to the children in Africa. It must come to those who are trafficked. But instead, here we are. You can take the whole world and give me Jesus. Just me and my Jesus alone. Oh, I'm loving up my Jesus. What kind of Christianity is that? Where did you get that knowledge from? Me and my Jesus alone. Oh, salt is not salt among salt. Salt is only good among the rotten and the dying and the decaying. That's the salt we are to bring, which means the real Christian is always a revolutionary. Oh, I should say that again. The real Christian is always a revolutionary. I hope you understand what I mean. That means wherever they put you, wherever they put you, they should be afraid of you. Because wherever, you know what they said in Corinthians? These men who have turned the world upside down, they have come hither too also. Wherever Paul went, trouble! Because he would stop and preach the gospel, teaching men. Making tent, he's working and he's preaching wherever he goes. That's it. That's what the apostle, apostle back then, is different from the apostle we have today. Apostle today means fancy suit. Somebody takes your Bible for you, 
And when you come in, the whole place freezes. What kind of uh, apostle back then was you are an apostolos, one who carries the good news of God. Wherever, wherever they were, wherever they were, they turned the world upside down. They didn't like them. Don't you understand? They didn't like these men. Not in love. They didn't like them. Because anywhere they go, anyway, people get insane. Demons. Do you know what time? Paul put a demon out of the business. Yeah. They got fixed with Paul. What is wrong with you? You deaf, dumb spirit. Out the cure. Yeah, but these are the men of God walking behind Paul. Paul turned around one day, couldn't take it. Paul was in a house preaching. He was a boring preacher, I can tell you that. Because a man fell through the window and died. I don't know who you're preaching an everlasting gospel. That's what I'm telling Paul is something else. Paul preaching all night. The man gets tired and fell when he died. You know that's in the Bible. Do you know what Paul did? He went and resurrected that man in the name of Jesus. I brought him back upstairs to listen to another three hour preaching. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's the apostle. We are to bring. Wherever you find a real Christian is a revolutionary. They're always a radical. They're always dangerous. Dangerous. At least that's the plan. And then there's a story told that Soren Kirky God. One told about a make-believe country where only ducks live. A make-believe country where only ducks live. <laughs> it's a make-believe country. On Sunday mornings, all the ducks came into church. This is a story, Sister Paul. All the ducks came into church. What? down the aisle, waddle into their pews and squatting. All the ducks. Then the duck minister came in, took his place behind the duck pulpit, opened the duck Bible and read, Ducks, you have and with wings you can fly like eagles. You can soar into the sky, ducks. Ducks, you have wings. And all the ducks in the church said, Amen. And then they all waddled their way home. Hmm. What a story. Jesus says to you, you are salt, be it. Jesus says you are light, shine your light, so that men may see. Notice men have to see it. You can't clap in your clothes house and you're walking around your house. Oh, That's good. But let me tell you where that -da 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 is work. You need some unsafe people to call you and tell you come and have some problems. Then we can know how powerful you are with your sha -da 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 -da. You need some people to call you and say, come lay hands on my daughter yeah. and see the sick. Yeah, you know, Saul would work in it, work in it. Yeah. It's not only in your house, it's good, isn't it? But what about the people who need, what the children, where are they? Where the children? What about those children? What about the young people who are commit, want to commit suicide? Could they call you? Will you go pray for them? Yes. Young person wants to talk to you alone. So let's bring this home. Let's make this real now. And we're going to finish. Four minutes after seven. Right now, you and I have got friends at work. People on your street. Acquaintances at gym. You know a lot of people. And they are one invitation away from coming to hear what Jesus would mean for their life. Question is, are you going to invite them? No. Nope. Ask them straight every Sunday. Leave them right there. Then we get a news, the person is dead. Uh, you know the person there. God, look at this life there. Eh? Are you being generous financially in the way? Let's the body of Christ do what we want to 
in our fullest potential? Right now, are you even thinking about social justice issues? I'm not saying you or the church talk about social justice. And what some people are going through and experiencing. The Bible talks about those things, you know. Does your heart break over sexism? Or is it we have sexism in the church? Men and women are created equal in God's sight. Do you tell people that? We may have different functions, but a man is not better than a woman. Neither is a woman inferior to a man. God created them equally. They have different roles and different functions. Does it break your heart when you hear sexism taking place? And racism? That's the one that I, I really can't tolerate is racism. You don't like somebody because of how they look, but can you? The trouble is we have no control over how I look. Because my father and mother did. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I, they didn't, my father and mother didn't ask me. If they asked me, I would have tell them, no. <laughs> I probably would have matched them up with somebody differently. But I had no control. I wasn't even in the picture. So how could you hate somebody? Because of the texture of your hair. When the same blood runs in our veins. I don't understand that. When you're sick, you don't care who looks at you. You just need somebody to look at you. Do you get upset over racism? Right now, here's another question. Are you praying? We're going to move on from that. If we live in a world where there is more violence, I've never seen anything like this in my life. More injustice. There are people in prison for years and can't get a trial. Date. It's wrong. 15 years. By the time you get sentenced, you already served the sentence. Who is going to repay those people? What about those who will be found not guilty but spent years in prison? It's just more racism. We live in a world if we were, if we live in a world where there's more racism, more division. More perversion. More crime. More hate. The pastor, Reverend McClatchy, told the commissioner of police when that um, policeman died and was shot. The funeral was held in Dabadi. He said, Mr. Commissioner, this is not crime. It's not crime we are facing. What we are facing is evil. Yes. Yes. I saw the commissioner nod his hair. This is not just. You know, in the 1980s, you had crime on a pick a pocket. And not now. This is evil stuff in the streets. It's not crime. You're lining. Now, don't you see that you're lining on the street? Men come up and shoot. He saw a man sitting at the bar, sitting. Man shot him in his head from behind. He didn't see it. That's evil stuff in the streets. Evil, evil. Could you imagine more crime, more hate? Could it be because there is less? Praying. We've been praying Thursday morning, and I don't like to talk about it because I know during my time when I was growing up, before my time, and it continues all the time. It is the least attended service. That's why I stay away from it. We've been having Thursday morning prayer. Yeah, about 10 persons from this fellowship comes to prayer. Ten of the membership. We love God, that's it. Less fewer people who should be sought and light are on their knees. We are busy. We are so busy preparing for this and preparing for that. Right now, you interact, you and I interact with all kinds of people, in different in all kinds of ways. What do they notice about you when you interact with them? What do you think about? What do they think about you? Do they say something about you that is not of this world? Or do they simply see you as one more person who is very much of this world? Just like they are. That's why we can't reach them. Because me and you are doing the same thing. I hear you, you're a Christian, you're in the church Sunday, you're the cousin every Sunday. I hear you in your neighborhood. The neighbors, that's why you can't reach them because you and I behave in the same way. 
I live in next to you and your house always. What is what's going on over there? I'm finished now. I know it's getting hot in here. Do they simply see you as one more person who's, you know, that's as much as, uh, just as they are, maybe even more, oh, maybe even more worldly than they are? Right now, you can serve in a way that makes a difference. Right now, you and I can serve in a way that makes a difference. I'm done. Number one, you can change a child's life. Some of us who have taken on, I know one of my pastor friends, he has about 20 something foster children. Lord of us. God bless him. Some of you have done that too. Yes. Number two, you can help by putting marriages back together. Yes. Don't try to spit on the people if there's no real reason. Yes. You help, you came in. You can help number three by strengthening families. You can help by being salt and light, by caring for the poor. The last of you done that. You can help. And Habitat for Humanity does this. Building houses for the homeless. I told you already when, when the, 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 the Archbishop of Port of Spain and, and the other one when they were, on the other bishop, sorry. When they were um, visiting 107 that evening, and I was listening. I listened to all of them. I have a problem. I listen to whenever they're talking. I learn from every one of them. And the, the Archbishop, I think, of Port of Spain, or, or the, the, the Anglican Bishop, said they, he went to the prison. And the, and the prisoner said, um, You want a Bible thing, you know? Who you bring for me? You don't see, you know, you don't come, just come sing a song and reach down the place, destroy us, tell them, bring it. You know, sometimes you have to do evangelism the way Jesus did it. Yeah. Put them to sit, give them fish and bread, and then teach them he is the bread of life, yeah. which cometh down from heaven. Yeah. Sometimes you have to help people. Yeah. What people need to see is the love of God being demonstrated towards us. In that while they are yet sinners, Christ died. And that would mean going in your pocket sometimes. And yes. Next, visiting the elderly. You can help by doing that. Somebody called me and asked me when to um, Thursday. We're going to visit one of our shut ins. I told him, yes, we're going. I'll be there. I might be tired, but I'm going. Next, stocking food pantries. In other words, always have some little extra to give somebody. Conveying the message of Christ to those with questions and doubt. Or are you just going to sit back and be a consumer week after week watching everybody else move the ball down the field? Or are you going to get up off the bench and get in the game with the rest of us? And don't tell me you don't know how. Don't tell me it looks like everything is covered. Right? They don't need help in this job. Right? Wow. Let me see. Uh -huh. Everybody. Everybody look. Everything covered. Huh? So, yeah, they really need. Yeah. Wow. Everything covered. Let's see. You, you just come all you want to open up. And, yeah, yeah. They're, they're covered. And so on and so on. So, you yeah. know. They said to me, get up off the bench and get involved. Eternity is a long time. God will reward you. Don't tell me that you're not needed. That's everything Jesus was trying to go to war against. That's denying you are to be salt and light. That's the bystander problem. That's it right there. Sit back and do nothing. That's the bystander problem. Because there are others who do it. Hello. So they sit and do nothing. Not me. I'm getting involved. Let them. Have you ever heard church people talk about ourselves and don't realize we talk about ourselves? Yeah. Them church people, who do you think we're talking to? You, you not church people. We're talking about us. It's all of us. One of the things we have to do is get involved. Jesus went to war for that. What kind of excuse would it be to stand before Jesus one day? And he says, why weren't you in the game? And you answer, well, nobody ever asked me. I died on the cross for you to give me that answer. 
Nobody asked me, Lord. They didn't call me. I needed, a, I needed a, a, an entire procession with a military band in front of me taking me. So nobody called me. I need to be called, Lord Jesus. I need them to usher me, Lord Jesus. Mm -mm. I need a red carpet, Lord Jesus. Let's march. Here, oh, here, oh. Here comes the deacon. He's going to give up his service in this area. Put your hands together. You see all them things there? Them things is show. Let me show business. Whatever you do, don't let your right hand know. But what you do in secret, your Father in heaven, who sees what you do in secret, will reward you how? And when God rewards you, oh, you will reward him. You're not supposed to have to be asked to do anything in God's house. Jesus didn't say the government was the light of the world. He didn't say education was. He didn't say the marketplace was. He didn't say the court system was. He didn't say the media was. He said, you are the light of the world. Yes. Acting as an individual. Right where you are, you are the salt, so be it. You are the light, so shine it. And don't do, don't waddle home as a duck. Let's stand for prayer. Don't waddle home. But you are the salt. You are light. Oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word. We come before you and bend in knees, we repent. We repent, Father. We haven't been doing what you called us to do. On bended knees I come. With a humble heart I come. Bowing down before your holy throne. Lifting holy hands to you. As I pledge my love and you. I worship you in spirit and I worship you in truth make my life a holy praise unto you oh God of mercy help me to be salt help me to be light help me to number my days I don't, I don't know how long more I have but help me to shine help me to get involved Help me to stop the decay in this world. Oh God, have mercy. Help me to do, to do what I can. Take responsibility for what I can do to bring light and to be sought. And even as we go, take us, oh Father, to our homes in peace and safety. Give us a restful night. And wake us tomorrow morning if it's your will. To bless and to praise your name and to be light and to be sought. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we want to thank all of you who joined online. Mr. Janelle, good evening to you. Thank you, Sister Rona Craig. Mr. Curtis Thomas. Austina Grant. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. And all the others on YouTube, thank you for joining. We trust you were blessed. God bless you. Have a great evening. May the grace and peace of God rest with all of you. Blessings.